what I'd like to do to begin this session is to ask each of the panelists here, beginning first with uh, Dr. Jackson, to share with us very briefly what it was that motivated them and inspired them to dedicate lives to the study of the history of African people. So Brother Jackson, if you can, share with our audience briefly. Well, uh, what inspired me to get into this field is I was born in a little town in South Carolina, Aiken, South Carolina, April 1st, 1907, all Fool's Day, so I've been acting like my fool all my life. <laughs> And in Sunday school, Thank you. that uh, the white race was superior. In church, they'd have these pictures. God is white on his right hand, and Jesus Christ, who is white, and on the other, on the left hand, is the Holy Ghost, who is white. A bunch of white angels in the background. And I found out the only black people you could find was down in hell, the devil and all of his angels. So I decided that I preferred to go to hell because I wanted to be with my own people. <laughs> so I was told that both in school and Sunday school. And there was an old minister there. And I didn't get along with him, so they sent a young minister there. And uh, I told the young minister that his predecessor had said that if I read books on evolution, I was going to hell. I said, of course, I immediately got a book on evolution and read it. <laughs> and he told me that not to worry about it, because everybody can't go to heaven. And that if I, I didn't have to worry about hell, that after the first million years, I'd get used to it, and then it would be quite pleasant. <laughs> I uh, had the opportunity of speaking with uh, Brother Jackson about two years ago, and I remember vividly that very first telephone conversation I had with him, and I was awestruck by um, his ability to remember dates, names, personalities. He was talking about Malcolm. He was talking about a host of people that I had only read about as if he had just spoken to them yesterday. And I said, we've got to bring this brother to Washington. And I made him a promise that we were going to get him here. Last year, uh, the best we could do was to have him spend two hours on the Captain in the Morning Show. But uh, today, we're very pleased to have him here. And I'd like to say, too, that uh, we also have to acknowledge those who are part of our family who are doing their part to keep this information alive, to work with those brothers and those sisters who have labored so hard to dig out this information. Uh, there's a brother here that I would like to acknowledge, uh, Brother uh, Kuti Chakalia, Melanie II. Uh, could you come out here, please? Come, could you come out here, please? Come on out here. This is the brother who is creating responsibility of the role for taking care of Brother uh, brother Jackson. He said that there were two individuals who charged him with that mission. Could you share that story with our audience, please? Young boy, I've already got it, brother and sister. Right. Uh, Africa is the news. Uh, early on in Chicago, on the west side of a place called the local eatery where we used to share 
the uh, review of books. Uh, the brothers sitting here, Brother John Henry Clark and Brother and Dr. Ben Yosef Yakuman, told me, Mr. James, take care of John. I accepted that assignment, that response, that commitment, and I have tried to live up to that. And I guess this is what he's talking about. That's right. <laughs> Clark, if you can uh, share with our audience briefly those things that got you started on your path. I came from our very poor sharecropper family, Union Springs, Alabama. A very religious family. I had a great grandmother who was uh, a cultist Baptist and who couldn't stand Methodists. <laughs> and so I began very early wanting to teach Sunday school and kind of halfway wanting to end up as a preacher. Some of my students tell me I'm a frustrated about the preaching who didn't make it to the pool camp. <laughs> could be right. <laughs> but when I began to look at the Bible, and when I began to teach Sunday school, I saw all those white angels, all those white deities, all those white saints. I began to wonder, of all the people who died, brown, yellow, black, none of them got to be angels. <laughs> God is love, and he didn't accept any of them. <laughs> I begin to question whether the holy book was really holy, or even us. <laughs> I begin to search for an answer outside of the book. I begin to search for the definition of myself and my people and world. I read an essay called The Negro Digs Up His Past for Arthur Schumberg, who taught me the interrelationship of African history to world history. Around 1934, I joined the Harlem History Club that became the Blind Society. There I met Wilson Huggins and his protege, John G. Jackson. Yeah. And both of them became, became, in a way, my teachers. And I learned a lot from attending Jackson's forum, his lectures at the Anglesall Forum. I began to systematic, I begin, I know now how, begin to learn how to question the literature of the Bible because I began to read the literature of examination. From Willis Huggins, I learned an invaluable lesson that is the political meaning of history. And from William Leo Hansberry at Howard University, from his lectures, I learned the philosophical meaning of history. I was trained by the black masters of the subject. I gained a lot from my association with Cyphers, whose work never saw the light of day, especially in his work on the African contribution to the Concept of the Brotherhood of Man. I learned a great deal from other Caribbean historians, J. E. Rogers, who did more in trying to show the personality of Africans in world history. 
I had to do a whole lot of things to hold myself together. Hold a job, all kind of jobs, working in restaurants, making salads, but study all the time. Studying at night when I had to work in the day, studying in the day when I had to work at night, but continuing to study. Give, literally gave myself a high school education and a college education. But my main focus is on the role of African people in the history of the world. I came by it by self-application, and I learned nothing in the universities but learned how the universities avoided the subject. Okay. Dr. Ben, I'd like to put the question to you. What was it that set you on the path to liberate so many minds? <clears throat> I guess my a combination of things. I, I am the product of an Ethiopian father, of the Hebrew community where they call in the West call us Palashas, and a Puerto Rican mother. How that happened? <laughs> they met in Spain. <laughs> uh, my mother was a, a candidate for a midwife, and my father was coming back from Germany. Uh, he was a barrister, 22 years older than my mother, and uh, he had just lost his wife and uh, had a little son. My mother was 19, I think. Uh, and coming through Spain and the Phaeton, that's the horse and the thing, my mother was stealing, going, run away from the place, going across the street to get something to go back in, and the horse railed and almost killed her, my father jumped out to save her. And he fell and oh, that's funny, that's what they said. And uh, <laughs> with that shock and everything, they got together, he told her, she wasn't going anyway, she was going to be his wife. They took, took her to the boat, to the uh, Gibraltar, and uh, Mary, the captain married her then. And uh, that's the beginning. I understood I was made someplace between the canal. <laughs> so that's how it started. <laughs> In my sixth year of age, uh, it was the time of Emperor Lijasu. I signed my father to go to Brazil to work as the uh, consul general there and the coffee and so forth. In the meantime, while well, being there in 1924, Salasi, uh, Diabuna, uh, Johannes, and a number of them overthrew the, the Lijasu government. My father uh, was then without anything. And so my mother took us, uh, we had to go to my mother's home, Puerto Rico, uh, and I re by way of Cuba, and then we went to Puerto Rico. I grew up in a system there where the Americans are taking over, Americanizing the, the Spanish Caribbean system into American system. And the school books, uh, I read a little book, Little Black Sun book in Spanish, and <laughs> And I went home to complain to my father about the thing was said about Ethiopians being savages and things like that. And then my father told me, he, he was a lawyer, a barrister with the books and the shelf. And there was always a little section with a, a uh, it always locked. And he used to clean the books with a feather, a thin feather. And he never, I could never go in there. When I told him this day about Africans being uncivilized that with Tarzan and Jane movie and so my father said, well, okay, let me show you this. And he took a key from his neck and the chain said, this is yours. He said, that, those set of books in there are yours. Uh, when you finish reading them, read all the footnotes, read the bibliography, and in the books that you read that you refer to, the footnotes in those books, the bibliography in those books. And when you finish them, come back and tell me who has no history. 
Well, <laughs> if you realize that some of the Book of the Dead, the, the and different books like that, and Apocalypse and all of, of different records, then you would understand that I would have to live a million years and still don't finish. And, and, and uh, my father said, well, when you finish them, I know you wouldn't finish, that when you die, read them down there. <laughs> So then I, I realized, and then my father wasn't satisfied, he said, no, it's time for you to go home to visit the night and see. So I went back to Ethiopia and visit my 11 grandmothers. I had my father's uh, father, my grandfather had 11 wives. And uh, so each other, then I tried to find out who was my biological grandmother. And they, my, my grandmother told me it was no damn business of mine. <laughs> because they didn't deal with who gave birth to the child. It's all was my grandmother's. And uh, they sent that around my father. So from then, it came a question when I came back, I started to speak to him about Egypt about the, at the end of the night. So he said, well, the best thing to do is to go to Egypt. But by that time, I had just got married. I was 18 and a half. Uh, I know that you don't like young married, but in, in the Ethiopian Orthodox family, that I got married late. <laughs> 18 and a half, because uh, they had picked out my wife, and I had to, that's why I was going to marry. I, I don't find nothing wrong with a good girl. Um, I have my first four children by her. And so that's how I started. Then I, the teacher, Miss Armstrong, I never forget from Texas one day, told me that Africans had no history. Uh, I've been showing the world, not her, because I didn't hear about her. I, I came out of school and went home, and there's a thing you couldn't do. My father gave me a weapon for leaving the classroom without permission, and then carried me the next day to the teacher to tell her who didn't have a history. And Miss Armstrong left the job that day. So, <laughs> and then I joined as a young man in the University of Puerto Rico. I, do, I joined Don Alviso, the nationalist movement of Puerto Rico, uh, and I joined the black church of the University of Puerto Rico. And then when the, the Texas, the Battleship Texas and the Talbot, they brought in to quell the our uprising in Puerto Rico, uh, we were tra trying to kill the American governor. Uh, we, did, we did try, and we we'll try again. <laughs> then then I, I joined, and then Marcus, a um, man named, we, 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 my mother's people are between the eastern of, of Puerto Rico, Fajardo, and Santa Cruz, which is called St. Christ. And they live between the two, so my father would practice between both, both places. So I have a Caribbean accent. I speak Spanish with Puerto Rican and English like a Virgin Islander. And uh, they were between the two places. There I joined Marcus Garvey's movement, a man named Morris Davis. Brought the Garvey movement to the Virgin Islands. I joined that. Hamilton Jackson was a, a lawyer and labor leader, became a judge and an atheist. I hook up with him because <laughs> the, the minister, the priest, used to hit people. After he hit people and tell them why you are doing church today. And I couldn't stand that nonsense. The <laughs> priest, and then I belong to, they have one Hebrew synagogue in St. Thomas. So my father would go Friday, we take the bus, the they, um, lunch, go to St. Thomas 40 miles away across the, uh, the Caribbean, go to the, they used to call it Jew synagogue. And the, one of the oldest, if not the oldest in the, character, in the Western world, went there and we were the only Hebrews. And the, the minister, the lamas would start to make comments about the black Jew in the midst. And so my father walked out, and that was the beginning of my end of Judaism. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that, those things led, led until at the university I wrote, I, I then realized that had to write something about myself and my people. And in 1939, I wrote, We the Black Jews. 
I, for somehow, I still felt necessary to be tied to a Jewish experience. But then, as I traveled, start my travel, uh, to went to Cuba to graduate school and to Spain to graduate school, I then realized that my problem was not being Jewish. That I didn't, and it was the last thing for me. So I severed that relationship and start to deal with African people as a group, rather than as Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or anything like that. I don't want to monopolize the rest of the time that we have left, because time is rapidly moving on. Uh, what I would like to do at this point in time is to ask those of you who have, who have questions to line up behind either one of the two microphones that we have here. And we like to take your questions in an orderly manner and so that we can try to facilitate as many people as possible. I would like for you to, I know it's difficult, but I would like for you to keep your questions brief. And if you can, uh, ask questions. I um, just want to preface that uh, tomorrow, Dr. Uh, Jackson's theme will be Dr. Hubert Henry Harrison, the black Socrates, and the influence that he has had on his life. Dr. Clark will talk about the history of the search for African history. And those individuals who were responsible for establishing a legacy that he was able to, to pick up and pass, pass on to us. So this is true, and that's symbolically a, a relay race. For those of a hundred or so years ago, did the research, documented it, passed it on. Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben, Dr. Jackson picked up the baton, ran the race, and now passing it on to the next generation. So it's our responsibility to keep the interest in the information alive so that we can pass it on to our children and see liberation very soon. Uh, Just share some, some spiritual words with us very briefly before we go to your question. Right, Andy. Uh, you know what the male rabbit said to the female rabbit? You will add to my happiness when you learn to multiply. You have so multiplied and you so added to my happiness. But on a very serious note, I would hope that we take this serious undertaking to be that of seriousness. We cannot uh, go on with this session without having remembered and to acknowledge one of our elders, elders, Brother Chancellor Williams. Amen. Brother Chancellor. You must acknowledge the spiritual existence of Brother Chancellor Williams. He's still alive. He communicated early on with the elders here, my brother. Uh, Jim Roberts, that he wants to be here, he wanted to be and he might still yet to come tomorrow, no high hopes, but at any rate, I would like for us to just not stand, because that would be too Christian, I think, Brother Ben, would it not? <laughs> <laughs> no seventh in its stretch, but at any rate, uh, just for about a half minute of silence, and don't bow your heads, don't close your eyes, we just look up and think about Brother Chancellor William that he's right here with us. Thank you. I'd like to begin this mic and then we'll go over here with the questions. And please uh, direct your questions to a specific uh, individual and try to keep them uh, brief. Brother? Yes, I, I just want to be very brief. Uh, my, my question is very simple. Do you think, with the, the three panels up there, that anything will change for black folks today or tomorrow with the history and knowledge that, or, or trying to learn about the history of black people or the beginning of what, what's happening and being aware? Will anything change where the white folks won't be on top anymore, that the black folks will have a chance to be? to die from all three times. Very, very, very brief. 
If we did what we supposed to do, if we united African people and stopped all the infighting right. among ourselves, learn to take care of ourselves, create an economic system by feeding ourselves and housing ourselves and educating ourselves, we wouldn't have to worry about what white people have to do. Judaism or, or Islam, 
but that you go back to the original Bible. Where may one, where may one obtain a copy of the original Bible? Thank you, sir. I didn't use the word Bible. I said I go back to the original concepts of spirituality. I stand corrected, Doctor. That is not guided by any specific Bible, but by a body of literature written by a Nile Valley scholar that, that preceded the Bible about three, four thousand years. And this was before fools and cowards and murderers <laughs> killed spirituality with a whole lot of nonsense called religion. Thank you. The mixture of offspring, Eastern, partly African people, they are in essence bastard children of bastard children. <laughs> They're human discards. Wrote that uh, little child story. 
And then their work was about 30 miles each side of where the guy was standing. Uh, for instance, they, they didn't know the land for Russia, they didn't know France, uh, they didn't know uh, Ethiopia at that time when I read that thing. Now, no, and the family got off the boat. His children, Ham, Jeffet, and uh, Shem, that's the three boys and their wives. The word Shemite came from Shem. Those children descended from Shem. And Hamite, the word, those children descended from Ham. And uh, poor Japhet, he, Jap, Jap, Japhet obviously didn't get nothing much, much because he did disappear. Now, then you got a woman, Mr. and Mrs. Noah, you don't want to chuckle. And Mrs. they get three children, three children of three different races. Pure nonsense. Now, the word Semitic Semit comes from that. It is a linguistic term that is used, but nobody can define what is a Semite. Okay, uh, Haribu, or from the, from the, about the 13th, when the Africans of the Nile were in the 13th dynasty, a group of people invaded from Asia called the Hyksos, otherwise called Shepherd Kings, about 1675. They destroyed the dynasty in the, low, in the lower Nile, the Delta region. Another group of people drove and came with them from the desert. Those people were called Haribu or Haribu, H-A-R-I-B-U or H-A-B-I-R-U, -B and there's a third one was H-A-R-I-P-U. That eventually became down to what is called Hebrew in the English language from that source, that, that's only the 13th dynasty. A Jew, among the same people, were tribes, different tribes. One of the tribes was called Yehuda, or in translated in English, Judah, which became in English for the Jew. And that's how you got the term Jew. It's a misnomer from the time Yehuda. Yehuda was supposed to be the warriors, the, those that defended the rest of the tribe. When the nation, uh, Palestine, broke into two, Israel, the, the, for the people, and uh, Judah, Judea, uh, those are the fighters. That, that's the whole story of that myth, the, the little piece of mythology that one's speaking about uh, here. And the, the, the story uh, behind that has no origin before 1700 at the, uh, 700 BC at the San, Sanhedrin. Uh, it, is, uh, it is supposed to be written from the books of Moses, and, and that again is a lie because there was four books of Moses, there wasn't five, and Rabbi Haripa, uh, the, Agrippa, didn't like it, and they, they start a conference, the, the, the conference of, uh, I forget what the name of the conference, but they decided uh, then that they needed another book, the book of Genesis, meaning the book of beginning, because they started with a book called Exodus, going from some place and Genesis, uh, to the extent to show you where they were, they wrote a book and wrote it about a black woman they used to worship. You call it, they said what? The, the sacred cow. Well, okay, that Abraham worshipped the cow. But they didn't tell you that that cow is the symbol of goddess Hathor. When you go in Egypt, you see the cow, a black woman with cow ears and things. You, you, that is the best way to see it is in a, a, a temple of Dendera. That's the symbol of goddess Hathor. So that what the Jews were trying to get away was worshiping this black woman. They, they tell you the, the golden calf and, the, and then Abraham, Aaron and, and, and Moses had a fight over the thing up on the hill, the mountain there, and they dropped the stone and, those, and, when they were, and then they built another, they took all the things that, all the things that stone, melted down and built another cow. Another, statue to a black woman. Because they said when they were worshiping Hathor, the golden calf, they weren't hungry. Naturally, if you deal with a black sister, you're never hungry.
<laughs> when, when people were calling themselves African American, Jesse Jackson's great grandfather to the tenth time removed wasn't a dream. People have been calling themselves African American. You have the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The look, Jesse jumped into something that he always jumped. And, and, and what Jesse should have done, in, if he was honest, was to say, look, I use a term I didn't have anything to do in its creation. Black people been calling themselves Africans from the time they've been there, before they was forced on the first ship by the Catholic, uh, by Pope Martin V. I like history. Uh, I like our story. Pope Martin V of the Roman Catholic Church, for you Romans, uh, started the slave trade using the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Genoa. So anytime you consider yourself a Roman Catholic, just remember you're worshiping your slave master. And just you gotta remember that Africans knew it was Frederick Douglass, again we come back to that guy, Frederick Douglass who went to Philadelphia when he was withdrawing from the American Colonization Society. He came there when Lincoln gave him the half, the half dead white woman after he lost his black wife died. And then he came there to withdraw, he had got the job, he had saluted the general. He went to Philadelphia to come and to leave and said, well, gentlemen, after all, how can you call me a black man or an African? He says, my father is a white man. My mother is a black woman. Therefore, I am colored. Henry Highland Garnett said, yes, Mr. Douglas. Have you ever heard a mule bragging about his father? He always speak about his mother, the horse, but never about his father, the jacket. during the time that so-called Greek philosophy was supposed to be written. He analogized it to New York City being so multicultural and the majority of the Greeks at that time were black. Uh, could you speak to that, please? And could you also speak to any modern day efforts to uh, reestablish African-American Greek letter organizations uh, to be the modern day representations of what they were supposed to be, which is the mystery school system of inner development, spiritual development? I don't know where Tony got his facts, but I could say I'd like to see the books and I'd like to see the mummies. <laughs> All I do know is that Greece as a nation, or as the first was called, was Pyrrhus, P-Y-R-R-H-U-S, was the remnants of a group of people that left Crete as uh, 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 and the other islands of the Mediterranean, were, which were colonies of the ancient Egyptians. And when we say Egyptians, you could have come from, the people living in Egypt, the Africans living in Egypt were Egyptians. They could have come from Ethiopia, from what is today Sudan, from Somalia, and so forth. There's no record of what that talk about, the, the, the Greeks being uh, 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 Africans. At, at, there's no time. When Africans were not there in certain amounts, but they were not African states, they, you could say the same thing. Rome had three African emperors, Car um, uh, Honorius, Caracalla, and uh, uh, Septimus Severus, Caracalla, Car uh, Septimus Severus' uh, son. They were from, from, uh, from Greece, who were, Agamemnon was an Ethiopian, and they claimed others. Uh, for instance, when you go to e Egypt, and you passed the Colossae of Memnon. They claimed that Memnon was uh, 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 a Greek. Uh, the Sphinx, the Greek claimed, was Abu Hul, uh, which the, 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 the Arabs call Abu Hul, the father of fear. Uh, so they claimed, but there were no question that there were Africans living early Greeks as teachers. 
But to say that the population was weak, any more so than Rome. Rome had the, as I said, Septimus Severus, who conquered the, uh, the French, Gaul, uh, defeated Commodus, went and, and, and captured uh, 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 Angoland, which is now called England. It was Septimus, Septimus Severus died in York in, in 185 of the Common Era. So that, I, I don't know where Tony got that journal from. Uh, <laughs> And, and oh, for heaven's sake, don't charge me with being a Greek. I, I don't, I, I've got enough trouble to, 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 to bring that nonsense at me. Uh, no, I, I'm not a Greek, I have nothing to do with it. Yes, I have some bastard children in Europe. Okay, uh, thank you, my news and lies. We've got about another half an hour of questions. So, be considerate. Brother. Dr. Jackson, Dr. Ben, Dr. Park. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, I've been uh, involved with the Martin Temple. Uh, Father Stalls was recently, in, in, in essence, broke away from the Catholic Church. And even though he continually says he has not uh, either stepped outside the church, I think as things go on, they get more and more as he, as he continues to search, he'll see, uh, I'll come to a realization that his whole, uh, I guess, idea of, of staying connected is something that it really should not be. And um, I wanted to, to ask uh, if you had to sit down with him and share uh, some advice or comments or just share anything with him, what would that be? Who are you directing the question to? Uh, Dr. Clark. Okay. I don't I want to clear on the subject, on this question, I'm sorry. During the last couple of months, uh, the local priests George Stallings has um, established the Imani Temple, African American oh, I, I, Catholic I'm congregation. Sure about that. I'm, I'm familiar about that. Right, and I'm wondering. Uh, it seems to me that as, as he continues to search, even though he says he wants to stay connected with Roman Catholicism, uh, from all the things that, that I've seen and heard even the last couple of years, it seems to me that as he continues to search, he come more and more to realization that that would not be a reality. It cannot be a reality. Well, and I wonder, understand the question now. Right, and I'm wondering if you, if he, if he was there beside you, what would you tell him? I what would tell him, you go strong enough to make you complete pray. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and to go back to that approach to spirituality that we had before the church. Look, I'm not irreligious. I'm not godless. And being without organized religion, that I think is a faith, I think I'm really better and above all this rubbish. <laughs> I think you, you should really understand that the church and the, and the teachings of organized religion is not essential to a moral life. All right. I mean, I don't need anybody to tell me thou shall not steal, thou shall not violate thy neighbor's wife. I got enough common sense. No, that. <laughs> <laughs> I check out the size of my neighbor. <laughs> You know, about that organized religion, look what it could happen. I would bet that I can't find, I may lose, but 10 Catholic in here understand their religion. And I don't think the Father wants to understand it because then if he understood it, he would not be worshiping Jesus, he would be worshiping Mary. It says, the Catholic Church is based on the assumption of Mary, not of Jesus. It is Mary who had it the Immaculate Conception. Her mother had her by a virgin birth. The teaching is Holy Mary, Mother of God. Blessed is the fruit, your fruit, your womb, that gives the birth to Jesus. What happens is that they stop worshiping goddess Isis, the Herculean worship of Isis. 
and masculine Europe could not deal with a feminine deity. So, and that's why they went to celibacy. So the father needs to go back home and say, I know, I said holy mother because I came from a hole. So it's holy, my holy mother. And, and you got no doubt, you didn't know college is word for me. You cannot, you cannot, if you lay with the dogs, you come up with the thieves. Uh, as far as Father Stalin is concerned, I think the best thing he could do is to get out of the Catholic Church altogether. <laughs>
I am aware of whether, why the question didn't come to me. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't join in since the question didn't come to oh. me. <laughs> but I would say in general. They always, my, my mother and my father and my folks always said to me, the first respect you have is your elders. They don't have to read and write and carry letters to their names. The mere fact that they preceded you, they have a knowledge which you will never have. And that the day you do not respect them, you got hell on your hands. If you insult the elders, always remember that your father got one trick at least up his sleeve you don't have. I want Edward saying this. My father, in trying to put it straight, said, son, I can go with any woman you have. I can get any woman you have. Because I was being French. I said, Daddy, you are the style. I will run ring around you. And Daddy said, let's make it short. I had your mother. <laughs> you know, I couldn't have my grandmother. So Daddy had the last blow. And that's what happened today. When you disrespect your elders, the elders will come back someday to get you. Good evening. Um, I'd like to direct my question to uh, Dr. Ben. Could you explain the origins of Freemasonry connected with Judaism and its African origins? The origin of Freemasonry. Number one. It is called by the West the mystery system. There's nothing mysterious about it. The persons in, well, certain priests in the mystery, in the, in the, let's call it, in the craft, the craft of Amudra. And those men were given the responsibility of, as stone builders, otherwise called masons. Those stone builders had the uh, responsibility of keeping the cornerstone to keep in line the building of temples, pyramids, etc. Because of that responsibility, they were free to do a lot of things. They, they had certain tablets. The West, like many things, the British, stole, came in and stole the 22 tablets, which they carried off to Scotland and held there. The 22 was considered the first 22 within a system, and that's the only thing that they have. So the 11, the other 11, that is called today York Rights, with all kind of changes to suit England. Those 22 is the only valid thing that they have. The other 11 called the 33 are equitable rights, are political. Uh, you kiss the grandmother, master, the right place, and you get some of those. Uh, and it stops there. In other words, what I'm saying to you, some of a little of the stone thing, uh, you will need to go to Egypt, and particularly if you go to, again, the, the grandmother of Luxor, you would even see the way the members of the crowd dress. They're 360 degrees to a circle. If you use the divisions in the West, you can make a circle with 10 degrees if you want to divide it. But the normal way is four quadrants. Four quadrants of 90 give you 360. How are you going to have <laughs> a, a complete circle with Western thought with 30, 32 degrees? It's, what they've done is try to make something African fit the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus to 33 for 33 years. Secondly, they put into it St. John Day. They had no John at all around. They had no 
Jesus, no Jehovah, none of those things were existing in terms of what they now call Freemasonry. And people dress up like penguins in the street walking around. Uh, the, 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 the point, what was the mystery system? It was the educational system. You know what? I'll give you a movie. A square plus B square equals C square. That's the mystery. If you don't know that, if you don't have basic uh, algebra, you wouldn't know the answer. You don't know what they're talking about. That's the mystery. And uh, these fellows here that call themselves Freemasons, 99% of them couldn't give you the answer to that question. All they can give you is what they had in some church, they repeat it again, drinking alcohol, messing with the next guy wife, that is Freemasonry in the West. But, but uh, Freemasonry, or what they call it, Masonified Law, is a whole different thing than when you see these guys running around with top hat and uh, fly tail and all like that, running in the street for the secret. How the hell is secret and they walking in the street? <laughs> see what they do. We are going to have to close at uh, 1045. Uh, the brothers are going to have to get the rest to prepare for tomorrow. So, uh, next question, brother. This is a short question for Dr. Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark, I, I know that you were a, um, a writer and wrote fiction before uh, becoming a historian. Would you address uh, comments to um, the problem of getting Afrocentric uh, history, the history that, that uh, uh, our elders here have been um, uncovering and speaking about for 50 years. How to get Afrocentric history, uh, the problem of Afrocentric history in uh, literature? Well, anything that's not in keeping with the norm encounters difficult because people have a preconceived notion of where all things are supposed to fit. And when you don't put it quite that way, it falls between the, between the cracks. Uh, some of um, Afrocentric literature has gotten into the textbooks. Uh, a story I wrote when I was 23 years old, which is over 50 years ago, uh, before we painted Christ black, it's, been, it's really the most reprinted of all black short stories. It's reprinted because of the flow of this writing. It's not even the best writing that I've done. But it's kind of a gimmick story and it's a nice children's story. It flows beautifully. So it, it, it got there, but there's a whole lot of good material that never sees the light of the light of day. Some things get published because it's a, it's a challenge. I think an essay I did called The Search for Identity been published in several places and used it in several textbooks because it, it explains how I came to seriously study African history in my own personal background in Alabama and my uh, love of my of the three women that shaped my life, my great-grandmother, my mother, and my fifth grade teacher, and how uh, really the greatest influence in my life is three black women. Um, and not that I have underrated any of the black men in my life, but the prevailing influence in my character of my life has really been three black women. And, some of the things I've written about them have gotten into uh, literature. This is a good answer to your question because I know a whole lot of good Afrocentric writing is being done that's not being published any place. And it's good caliber work. I think we need more publications, we need more magazines. Uh, Violon is no more. The Journal of Negro education is publishing a great deal anymore, and young higher education seems to have gone out of business. The Midwest Review that used to be published at Lincoln in Missouri is out of business. 
and the Urban League and the NACP used to publish different magazines, and that's no longer a publishing outlet. So we need the organization of publication. Johnson had underwritten Black World, Black World and he wasn't losing any money, just wasn't making a whole lot. And that went out of business because of the pressure that was put on, on Johnson and people let him get away with it. <coughs> Black people get angry too many times and they don't take time out to write a letter, pick up a telephone and call. And let people know that. They don't like the Eurocentric literature in the in the school books, and if enough parents just point out a good piece that they think should be there, eventually somehow it's going to get there. If you let the textbook houses know that I'm not going to buy your text until this textbook reflects the composition of the population of this country. And this is a multi-ethnic country. But not enough people speaking that way. Not enough people showing that kind of concern. I, I think one thing very important is that we have to begin to become more interested in reading and supporting authors who are writing the book. Dr. Carr is writing two books right now. He's writing two books. Dr. Jackson, uh, Dr. Jackson, he just uh, recently wrote uh, one or two books. Paul Fultz is in the process of publishing a book that you wrote an introduction for. Is that correct? The, the information is here. We have to develop the appetite for the information. Uh, there are two people in the audience, uh, Alicia and, and Ken, that uh, are part of an organization. Uh, could you all stand for so we can uh, identify you? Alicia and Ken, they're part of an organization that is spearheading uh, parental and community uh, participation in the placing demands on the school system to develop and implement an Afrocentric curriculum. You all need to touch bases with them before they leave tonight so that they can get your name and address and you can become a part of this movement. It's going to be up to us in order to bring about a change. We have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, we're going to do the best we can. The sister over here, the brother over here. We are going to have to close down the mic at uh, 1045. Uh, the brothers have, have a schedule that they have to maintain in order for them to come back tomorrow uh, afternoon. Sister. To any of our elders who care to address this question, what do you consider to be the present and the future impact of Brother Louis Farrakhan on black people? I, I think Louis Farrakhan has had a major impact on the black freedom movement. He's glib, he's smart, and he's got a good, sharp mind. He's a much better biblical student than Jesse Jackson. He reads well. He, sometimes his emphasis is misplaced. He's always trying to sell Islam, and I just don't think that I would need this for another religion. I would need it for a new spiritual way of, way of life. And, and I'm a little sick of it. Of the assumption that Islam is the black man's true religion. <laughs> Islam is a comparatively new religion. It came into being around the 7th century AD. And uh, it came into being so fast it had to take something from Zoroastrianism, something from Christianity, something from Judaism, and Back is probably the least original of the world's religions. There's nothing wrong with that, but just don't tell a lie about it. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Do you have any other comments Brother Jackson, uh, would you want to make any comments in regards to that question? Well, I uh, think Byron is doing some valuable work. But, uh, you know, I do think that. Uh, uh, all of these religions are rackets, and uh, you know, <laughs> we should try to straighten ourselves out and not uh, introduce all this nonsense. Uh, I knew a, a woman who was a preacher in Chicago on one of those religious programs, and some 
very stupid woman called in and said she didn't have any job and she didn't have anywhere to live and she was having a hell of a time and all that. She said, no, don't worry about it. She told her, said, I ain't got no education. She said, you don't need an education. Just let Jesus stop on it. <laughs> Dr. Penn. All right, Dr. Penn, from your, one of your programs that you did uh, for For the People, uh, it, you mentioned that the African civilization started uh, around 700,000 years ago. Okay. Uh, and I'm trying to, I mean, that's what I got from the tape. I reviewed it today. Okay. Uh, and also, you mentioned. Uh, 250,000 years ago, the civilian period began. Could you elaborate on, on what that really means to us, for us today? And uh, how do you come about with that 700,000 years? Okay. And uh, where, where is that place located as far as the archaeological site? If you review that in a tape I said, then I certainly have to ask these people for a forgiveness for my error. <laughs> And being human, I guess I am one of that, that there must have been one of those flaws of mine. But one has to remember that the oldest African that we have, that we're not guessing about, is called Denkmesh. You know her as Lucy, but I'm not a European, I'm an African. So I know her as Denkmesh. That's the name. Ethiopians gave to that person. So at least 3.2 million years ago, they were Africans. I don't think she was here by herself. <laughs> now, now we have we have writings on various stones by the uh, people in the southern tip of Africa called Grimaldi. We have their records. We have writings in the Tassidi Mountains in Northern Africa and others going back four, five hundred thousand years, thirty thousand, ten thousand. So we have a, an iron mine in Swaziland, forty-three thousand years. That means to our people were, and they, these are the carbon tests and everything, even making iron at least forty-three thousand years ago. So the Sibylum period goes back. Sibylum first, uh, 300,000 years. Sibylum second, 25,000 years. And Sibylum uh, first, 6,000, uh, at third, 6,000 years ago, or beginning of pre, pre dynastic period. So those are the recordings and the archaeological finds. And that's why I've I returned to not only writing, but I've gone back to digging. To, to doing what needs to be done. And I hope that some of our university students before give up some of the Greek speaking and do some to do some uh, virgin research. And I think you're always talking about virgin. Do some of your virgin destroying by digging up the earth and finding for us to reclaim our history. So if I said that. I stand corrected. If I said 700,000 years, uh, since sometime I'm dealing extemporaneously, that, that ridiculous term. I'm dealing by memory. Uh, sometimes I get slip, and if you find a slip, bring me to task and I'll correct it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Jackie, you're going to have to close it out with the last question. The four brothers that are in line before you all leave and walk away, if you're going to be here tomorrow, I'll uh, give your name to the sisters at the back desk, and you'll be the first four in line tomorrow. Thank you very much, Jack. I don't know who should answer this question, and I'm almost ashamed to ask. However, the D.C. public school system is considering uh, infusing an Afrocentric curriculum into its curriculum, and they've been asking about the definition of Afrocentricity. And I really think that question should be, should be addressed by the elders. So can you give us a definition of Afrocentricity for the D.C. public school system? I don't know what it means. Uh, I, I want, first of all, I don't know what Africa is. Uh, why, uh, why the O in Africa? African 
African centricity, I could understand, but I don't know what is meant by Afro. Said Afro what? Afro the Hindu? No, why this? Why? Why? Why we got to make Africa always something else? You hear European American, not Euro American. Uh, African centricity to me means that thing with Africa as the base. So that if the child comes into a place, whatever it does, it does with an African background in mind. That it, when it thinks of its mother, its mother and Africa are simultaneously one. Also with the father, so that the trinity of the person, like me, I come from a trinity, a sacred trinity. Uh, my mother, my father, and me, we make the trinity. Now, but the major source is Africa of this trinity. This is the source from whence we came. So every time I think of my mother, I think of my father, I think of myself, I think as us as from this African base, from this overall great mother, the continent of Africa. Got to make one brief announcement, brief question, please, over there. No, no question, just an announcement, uh, piggybacking on what the sister had said about infusing African and African American studies in the schools. Uh, in Atlanta on October 5th through the 7th, there's going to be a national conference on that subject and on that issue. Asa Hilliard is coordinating the conference. I'll have some information that I'll give to you, Tony, uh, tomorrow on that. Uh, and instances such as this is what's needed because there will be about a thousand administrators and teachers at that conference. If you can drive down to Atlanta, I'll give the information to you, Tony, tomorrow. Okay, we'll have that information available. Uh, at this point in time, we're going to have to bring things to, to, to closure. Uh, there's a brother here, I'm sure many of you all have heard him on the radio, speaker of black reparations, Brother Elder Yehuda. Uh, he's on here to share some of that information and very important document with you. You can see him in, in the back. Uh, we would formally like to bring this session to a close tonight. We will begin promptly at 12 noon tomorrow. We will hear from Dr. Clark and Dr. Jackson, and we will bring the elder symposium to a close. Thank you all very much for coming.